so of course you're 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 making the case for why we need elderhood in this time of trouble. And yeah. if we don't have elders to look towards, if we don't have anything to like you mentioned the the Italian woman, you know, food makes you hungry. Without food, you wouldn't feel the hunger for it. Right. If I don't have an elder to look towards, if we as a culture, as a people are bereft of elderhood. Yeah. And people are again asking to be recognized as elders without actually being elders. Right. I'm not I think it's again a naive thing to ask for a solution because that isn't what you're going to provide and you're not here to provide a solution. But how do you sense this is going to play out? I mean, I I I on this podcast in particular, um I discuss a lot of environmental issues. I discuss what's happening with our climate system, with the uh, ecological systems of our planet and how we are in a time of massive, unprecedented, catastrophic change. And and elderhood, if anything, would represent the time and the place that we are in right now. And so what is elderhood? Of, sorry. Sorry, the plight of elderhood. The plight of is, elderhood. Is, is one of the human echoes of the ecological dilemma you just articulate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would elderhood look like, feel like, be like in mm -hmm. this time that we are in? Very good. Very good. You see, that's a, that's a very achieved question now. Rather than to ask about elderhood in some kind of abstract universal constant, your question actually tips towards the answer. That means your question includes the acknowledgement that there, there are something particular about this time that might have consequence for elderhood that is not entirely catastrophic. Exactly. So, you know, you credited me with having no answers. And <laughs> let me let me see if I can be, you know, make you uh, doubt that ever so slightly. <laughs> so, so here we go. Now, if elderhood is an identity and swept up with all the other identity clamor of our time, then what you'd go about doing is looking for people with that, quote, personality type or that kind of wrinkle. Or maybe there's an elderhood MMPI. You familiar with the phrase? Uh, no, I'm not a psychological testing apparatus whereby we can tease out, you know, elder tending personality types, things like this. And then you can identify the particular um, kind of elder you're looking for and dial that in, et cetera. And before you know it, instead of speed dating, you got speed eldering maybe on the internet. And you just, you know, you just <laughs> tell them what you're interested in as far as being mentored. And lo and behold, you know, 10 older people pop up and you get to choose. I mean, I wouldn't be the least surprised that that would come. Mm. And somebody's going to work on it as soon as they've heard me suggest it, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So not another sign of the end times, you see? Yes. But, but I'm going to offer you an alternative to that. And I'm going to suggest to you that elderhood is not a figment of personality. It's not an aspect of identity. It has nothing to do with the particular qualities of individuals. Yikes. Well, where else does it live? And the answer is, Elderhood is first, foremost, and will always be a cultural function. And in that understanding, an elder is a culture worker. And as such, not inherently, inevitably, or, or mandatorily, an old person. Having said that, I'll acknowledge something, that it would appear to me to be a truism that while um, all elders tend to be older, not all older people are elders. Okay, so there's something that works in that arrangement. So if elderhood is not a personality type, what else could it be? You've said it's something to do with culture, but, but what precisely? Well, the answer is the subtitle of my book is, it's why I called it The Case for Elderhood in a Time of Trouble. I'm saying that I believe that the, that the particular wrinkles of elderhood are dictated by the times in which the possible elders find themselves. They were born to a particular time, and the particulars of those times dictate what elderhood must be now, you see. So this means elders themselves must be on the steep learning curve, and they must be deep running students of, the, of their times, and their responsiveness to their times is what qualifies them. So the word responsibility 
really works here. You know, it's not a sense of burden the way people usually use the word. The, the sense of responsibility means simply the capacity to respond, maybe to distinguish that from react. Maybe react, we could use that word to describe certain responses you have that attempt to satisfy you or assuage you or reassure you, whereas the capacity to respond might have nothing to do with you trying to feel better about anything. It might have to do with your sense of a kind of moral, political, cultural, spiritual obligation to, to fully inhabit the conditions of citizenship, if you will. But your citizenry is not to a particular geopolitical identity. Your deep citizenship is, um, is a devotional one, not an affiliation one. And in, in that sense, you know, the work that you join yourself to is dictated by your time's troubles. And that's what you're a citizen of. You're a citizen of a troubled time, not Canada or the United States, you know, or any other, um, you know, freewheeling entity today. So if that's possible, if that's possible, then it means that elders are not in the business of getting themselves recognized. They're in the business of recognizing. So you could say in a time when elderhood's gone into terrible abeyance, which is certainly our time now, then it becomes the, the eldering responsibility of elders to function at the level of recognizing incipient elderhood in their midst and proceeding accordingly by acknowledging it, recognizing it, corroborating it, um, living as if it's true, um, authorizing it without ever trying to be included in it or to benefit directly from it. Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay, it's a, it's a radical re-understanding of what it means to be an elder. And it's not a club you get to join. It's the ending of all clubs in a time like ours. That no elder in a time like this, if I may sound programmatic about it, no elder in a time like this would ever call themselves an elder. Ever. Okay, why not? Because this is the responsibility of the people around them to recognize elderhood in their midst, to corroborate it and everything I just said. And if it doesn't happen, it's because there's no elders to do so. And because the appetite for elderhood has gone missing in the way we talked earlier about if kids are young people are not exposed to it, then their appetite for it begins to atrophy. And they, they trade it in for self-reliance or for a kind of principled anxiety that masquerades as having a conscience. But it's more at the level of just a chronic free-floating anxiety where you care about everything, but only enough to paralyze you or to animate you with extraordinary levels of kind of sulfuric anger and incandescent rage that doesn't know how to proceed, this kind of thing, <clears throat> which is a kind of narcissism, frankly. So <clears throat> this is an awful lot to say <clears throat> in response to a <clears throat> short question, but if, you know, at the risk of sounding like I'm giving a, a formula of how to pull this off, I would simply say in a time like ours now, it might be the fundamental responsibility of people who may yet come to inhabit the elder function that they must do so minus acknowledgement, minus recognition. And the way they do it is by corroborating the, the presence of elders around them. So a very quick way of saying it, and this gives away basically, you hear this, you don't need to buy the book, and I guess that, but it, it would come down to this. The greater elderhood skill now is the skill of having, of knowing how to have elders in your midst. It is not the skill of knowing how to be one. 